We're going to be in the uh, fifth chapter of Revelation tonight, and uh, probably half of the sixth chapter will go from this moment when God on the throne holds out his right hand with the scroll, the book of God's judgment in it, right through the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Some of you who are old sports fans may think I'm talking about the backfield for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame post-World War II. That was their name, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But this group that I'm talking to you about tonight is a little earlier than that. So <clears throat> stay with me. Father, we ask you to bless your word tonight. We are keenly aware that you are moving around the world. We're keenly aware of the fact that the next thing to happen in major prophecy is for the skies to split asunder and Jesus come back. Make us ready, make us aware, let there be an urgency and a passion about the things that we do for the cause of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I had to laugh when Art opened up the service today and he asked you to shut off your cell phones, particularly if, if when your phone rings, it's a trumpet sound. <laughs> Boy, there'd be a bunch of cardiac arrest here, wouldn't there? <clears throat> All right, page one, starting with line seven of your notes tonight. Last week when we closed the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, we were standing around the throne of God. I'll read you those last three verses again. You can follow with me beginning with line 11. And when those four beasts, those are the great four seraphim, the six winged seraphim that constantly hover over the throne of God, proclaiming his majesty and his holiness. We see them clear back in the book of Isaiah and continuing right on through in the presence of God. You'll see them in person one of these days. When those four seraphim give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him who sat on the throne. Who are the four and twenty elders? Oh, you're discouraging me, people. Who are the four and twenty elders? Us, that's right, that's us. And we cast our crowns before the throne if we have any to cast. Just the fact that we are there around the throne does not automatically ensure that we have any crowns or rewards. Re rewards are not automatic with salvation. And we sing, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, listen to this next line, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. If you watch a lot of media now, read some of the Christian books coming out, you would think that God was created to make us happy. Just the opposite, you and I were created to make God happy in any way that he chooses for us to make him happy. We all come by Jesus Christ, but we all have different lives that we live in different callings. And our job is to make him happy. For thy pleasure we were created. I uh, jotted down a little note here about the, the sound that will be there, that glorious moment when we're around the throne singing the praises of God. We know there will be at least a hundred million angels, at least that many the Bible speaks of, and there may be infinitely more than that. All of the saints of God from Abraham on are going to be around that throne singing. David will be over there somewhere with his harp, and uh, the trumpet angel will be around there somewhere. You might want to bring your cell phones for that occasion. It might work there. But it's going to be a great giant symphony of music. It will be wonderful. What a day of rejoicing. As I was writing these notes the other day, it made me think of the great old hymn we used to sing in church. 
written by Eliza Hewitt. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a what? A place, that's right. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread on streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Reminds me of one of my favorite stories in the whole world, and those of you who attend here regularly have heard me tell it, but so many of you are visiting with us tonight. This story is just too good not to tell you. There's an old boy that uh, made a lot of money in life, and he had always heard, you can't take it with you. He said, well, I'm going to. I'm taking everything with me when I go. So knowing that he was critically ill and probably going to die, he converted all of his holdings into gold. And on his deathbed, he had this massive chest bound to his chest, a huge trunk bound to his chest. And on the trunk, there was a massive lid that had four combination locks to it. And it was opened up. And when, with his last gasp, they put all that gold into that chest, which crushed the last breath out of him. And the door of that safe on his chest slammed shut. And only he knew the combinations. And when they buried him, they had this big casket deep grave, lowered him into the grave with a winch. That's a new line. I've never used that one before. <laughs> Covered him up, and the old boy finds himself at the pearly gates. And there's Peter. Peter said, what in the world? I have seen millions of people come and go. I've never seen anybody with a contraption like that. What in the world you got on your chest? He said, I proved them all wrong. Everything in this chest is what I worked for all my life. They said I couldn't bring it with me, but they were wrong. And I've got it right here, my whole life's work, right here. Peter said, well, that's interesting. Could I see it? I said, yeah, I can trust you. I'll show you what's in here. So he reaches around, then he starts with one combination lock. <laughs> Opens all four of them. And grandly and with pride, he opened the lid and said to Peter, Look! And Peter looked, and he said, pavement? <laughs> Paved with gold. We're in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. You can follow along on page 2. That's the King James Version. You have the NIV probably there in the bookshelf in front of you on your seat. And uh, if you don't like either one of those, watch the screen. Chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. In the right hand of the one sitting on the throne, I saw a scroll that had writing on the inside and on the outside. And it was sealed in seven places. I saw a mighty angel ask with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or see inside it. I cried hard because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or see inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Stop crying and look. The one who is called both the Lion from the tribe of Judah and King David's great descendant has won the victory. 
he will open the book and its seven seals. Then I looked and saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne that was surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb looked as if it had once been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. The lamb went over and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. After he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders knelt down before him. Each of them had a harp and a gold bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Then they sang a new song. You are worthy to receive the scroll and open its seals because you were killed. And with your own blood, you bought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, and race. You let them become kings and serve God as priests, and they will rule on earth. As I looked, I heard the voices of a lot of angels around the throne, and the voices of the living creatures and of the elders. There were millions and millions of them, and they were saying in a loud voice, the lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. Then I heard all beings in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea offer praise. Together, all of them were saying praise, honor, glory, and strength forever and ever to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The four living creatures said, Amen, while the elders knelt down and worshipped. Well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> you know what was going through my mind as we were watching that? I'm going to be there. I'm going to see that with my own eyes, glorified eyes. You say, Pastor Betsy, you don't really think. Read my lips. Yes, I'm going to be there. I shall behold him. Praise the Lord. Verse number one, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that was God, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. There was no such thing as a flat book back in those days. It would have been a scroll that you could open like this. It had writing on both sides, and it was sealed with seven seals. On page 2, line 40, I talked to you about a seal. A seal was a device often made of wax, having an imprint, usually by a ring or something, pushed upon it which forbade the unauthorized from opening it. Once broken, a seal was impossible to repair without leaving telltale traces. That's from old Salem Kerban, my old friend of many years ago. <clears throat> can you even imagine, can you even imagine the stunned looks in heaven when God holds out that book and holds out this huge scroll, which is the book of judgment of those things that are going to happen on earth. We're not on the earth when this happens. We're in the presence of God, probably in that third heaven that Paul talked about. Remember, there are three heavens. There's the atmosphere that we breathe, which is rather thin. Then there is space. Did you watch the space shuttle land today? Wouldn't you like to have been on that? Ah. No? It landed. They came from space. And then above and beyond all the stars, beyond the Milky Way, the constellations, there is a third heaven, which we believe is the abode of God. This is where we're going to be when this takes place. Now, verse 2, next we hear one of those angels, a strong angel, invite any one of us to come to God's throne and take the scroll out of his hand and open it. 
any of us who feel we are worthy are invited to come and take the book out of God's hands. Here's your chance. You wanted to run up and jump up on God's lap. Maybe they're even going to hold back the lightning coming out of the throne for a moment. That would be a requisite with me. Hold back the lightning. So here's your chance. When I get to heaven, I'm just going to run up on God's lap and just hug his neck. No, you're not. You may think you are, but you're not. Now you have an invitation. We're standing there by that crystal sea, watching the throne with the rainbow over it that was described in chapter 4. We see the massive four seraphim with their six wings, two of them covering their face, two of them covering their feet. With two wings, they fly, crying, holy, holy. <laughs> We're going to stand there and say, oh, man. And all of a sudden, one of the angels says, Who's worthy to open the book or to even loose the seals of? Here's your shot. This is your chance. But nobody does it. Nobody goes up there. Verse 3, no man in heaven or in earth or under the earth was able to open the book or even to look at it. What's happened to all the men and women of faith that we hear about? Now, ladies and gentlemen, God's man of faith and power where are you when we need you? Somebody needs to take the book out of God's hand. There's nobody. Nobody would take the book out of God's hand. Verse number four, John is weeping because no one can take the scroll from God's hand. Now this is such a fascinating study right here. Nobody in all of eternity up there around the throne feels worthy to take the book out of God's hand. And John, the beloved apostle John, is standing there, stunned, crestfallen, weeping, because nobody, Abraham's not going up there, not Abe. You don't see David trotting up there to get it out of God's hand. You're not even going to see Billy Graham, bless his heart, one of the great ones of all time. And John said, I wept. None of us, none of us in the presence of the Holy God could even begin to look at the book or let alone look at God. But one of the elders, one of the saints of God standing there is peeking. And I just always kind of thought of him as a Baptist. <laughs> I'm sorry. At least they'll be there, you know. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be there. He's peeking, apparently, because he sees something, someone striding through the crowd toward the throne. And he says, John, psst, John, stop your crying. What? Look, behold, that's what that means. Look, John, what? Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is Jesus Christ. This is where you and I will get our first real look at our Lord. Donnie Rambo sings, we shall behold him. We shall behold him. Well, Pastor Betzer, that's not exactly right because the rapture, we saw him. Yes, we did. But it was, pew. how good a look did you get there? <laughs> but now, the old songwriter wrote, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. So why is he called the lion of the tribe of Judah? Let's talk about Judah for a little bit. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is Matthew chapter 1. It's a 
It's the chapter that says so and so begat so and so who 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 begat so and so. You find that interesting, Pastor? Yes, intensely so. Because there are 42 generations listed in Matthew 1 who are the generations that preceded Jesus. Jesus came from those people. And they were all wonderful, godly, moral men and women. Now, wait a minute. No, no, no. Some of them were rotten. Judah was one of them. Rahab was one of them. The town Madam in Jericho, where those two spies went. I've heard a lot of sermons preached about those spies. They're in Jericho. They're away from Joshua and all the prying eyes of their peers, the Israelites, they're in Jericho. And just happened to find a place to stay in this house of ill repute. <laughs> sure. But Rahab wants to help these guys and save them. And eventually, she's redeemed, and she marries one of those spies, we believe. My Jewish friends who are scholars tell me that she married Solomon, who was one of the spies. He's mentioned there in chapter 1 of Matthew. So, you know, Solomon and Rahab, you want to join First Assembly? Uh, I don't know about that. Judah? You know, David, King David, couldn't have even wished for credentials in the assemblies of God. God has a whole lot of different ways of keeping score than you and I do. So here are these people who are the progenitors of the Christ. Solomon and Rahab produced a grandchild whose name was Boaz who owned a ranch down near Bethlehem. He saw this beautiful girl out in the field one time just reaping some grain that had been left over so she and her family could eat and this girl's name was Ruth. Boaz married Ruth. They became the great 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 grandparents of this guy named Jesse who became the parent of a kid named David who was the progenitor of the Christ. Did you ever stop to think what God could do with you? All he wants is our availability. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. No, 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 they don't, Pastor Betzer. If they did those bad things, we just have to. It is our ministry to remind them. <laughs> Pretty hard to remind anybody of something that's under the blood. <laughs> and God's forgiven it. And by an act of his own will, he can't even remember it. Did you ever stop to think when accusing thoughts come to you about your past, they can only come from three or four different sources. They could come from God, but they don't because sins that are washed away and are forgiven are never remembered by him. So it can't come from God. It could come from Satan, who's the accuser of the brethren. That's generic. It means also the cistern. So he accuses us, and he, he brings it up all the time. One of the greatest lines of my lifetime, somebody came up with it, not I, but somebody. The next time Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. That ought to end that. Sometimes people will remind you because that's their ministry. <laughs> But usually, the condemning thoughts come from ourselves. We don't forgive ourselves. When we've come to God and said, Lord Jesus, I repent, I bitterly repent, wash my sins away, wash me clean, that's gone. It's over and done. 
Jesus has forgiven us. The book of Romans tells us there is therefore now not much condemnation to those. What? Oh, you're sharp tonight. There is what? No condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit of God. At least attempt, I attempt never to preach on the basis of appealing to somebody's guilt. Somebody asked me that one time. Why don't you try to appeal to people's guilt? Because it's not my job to do that. If anybody's going to do it, the Holy Spirit will do it, not I. And besides that, if you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't have any guilt, so you're just talking into the air anyway. Talk about Jesus. Talk about the love of Jesus. About the precious blood of Jesus. Somebody can say amen to that. Well, one of these guys was Judah. Judah was one of the sons of Jacob, who had 12 sons by four different women, all of whom he was living with at the time. We're now going to watch another chapter of As the World Turns. <laughs> Leah, who was his first wife, bore him Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar and Zebulun. Bilhah, who was Rachel's handmaiden, bore him Dan and Naphtali. Zilpah, Leah's handmaiden, bore Gad and Asher. And then Rachel, who was the love of Jacob's life, and his second wife gave him Joseph and Benjamin, and she died in giving birth to Benjamin. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob. In the box you read, few details of his life are known. On the positive side, he probably saved Joseph's life by persuading his brothers to sell him into Egyptian slavery rather than kill him, as recorded in Genesis 37. However, in Genesis 38, his sexual sins were disgraceful stains on his character. He gradually appears to have achieved leadership among his brothers, and there's the references, through his son Perez, Judah became an ancestor of David. You can look to Ruth chapter 4 for that. And of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1, that great chapter. The blessing of dying Jacob to Judah is usually understood as being a messianic prophecy. Do you ever, when you read the Bible, do you just kind of race through it? Or, or do these characters come alive to you? I mean, because of Sunday school, as when I was a kid... These characters are so alive to me. Jacob is, is an old, old man. I was way up past 130, and he's on his deathbed. Godly man in his later years. He's dying. Most of his sons were rotten. So from his deathbed, he calls them over. And the first one he calls over is the oldest, who is Reuben, and simply because he's the oldest, he's supposed to get all the inheritance, the birthright, the blessings. So here are the boys. Turn on the screen of your imagination. See, do you see Jacob lying there? Got the IVs in his arm. Can you see him there? He's dying. And very faintly he calls, Reuben, Reuben, come here. You'll find this in the book of Genesis. So Reuben comes over, watch this boys, this is, <clears throat> this is where I get the inheritance. <clears throat> oh father, father don't die, don't die father. How am I doing boys, you think he's buying this? <laughs> oh don't die father. Reuben, <laughs> Reuben, what, what, what is it father, what are, you trying, what are you trying to tell me? You're standing on my air hose. <laughs> in there. <laughs> well, what about the inheritance, Father? Reuben, bend down so you can hear this. Here's what I'm giving you, Reuben. <laughs> so that's it for Reuben. Next boy comes up, Simeon. Hey, boy, Rube, you got told off. I guess it's all for me. Yes, Father, what is it? Did you hear what I just said to your older brother? Reuben, 
Yes, and he deserved it, Father. You did that rightly so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So Simeon, two of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Levi, same thing. Uh -huh. Judah, in the meantime, who's so rotten, but recently has really got right with God. Reuben's standing over in the corner. I see this as clear as I can see. You stand over there. Oh, man, I don't want to go up there. <laughs> Judah! He wants you up there, Judah. Oh, Father, Father. Bend down here, Judah. What is it, Father? Everything goes to you. Because Judah had got right with God and man. And he becomes the great ancestor, the great progenitor of the Old Testament race of people. And all of Jacob's sons, the 12 of them, had tribes listed after them. One of them was the tribe of Judah. Judah? Named after him? Yeah. And centuries later, a great old prophet named Micah would take out parchment and a quill. And anointed by the Holy Spirit, he would foretell the greatest miracle that ever happened. God became a man. How? And Micah wrote, Thou, Bethlehem, are not the least of the provinces of so on that starry night when the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth it happened in the province of Judah and the lion of heaven was born there when we are, are referred to here in this fifth chapter, Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. You see how the Bible stays together? We pick up this sordid story of Judah way back in the very first book of Genesis. But he's a changed man even in Genesis. And you get 65 books later into the 66th book of Revelation. And he's even honored in heaven. So, my dear friend, you who've come in here tonight thinking that God's written you off. God has never written anybody off. Well, I've been told that I've committed the unpardonable sin. You taking breath into your lung? Is breath coming out your nose? Then you have not committed the unpardonable sin. And the fact that you're in this building tonight reminds us of the great invitation at the close of the book of Revelation. Whosoever will may come. If Judah could make it, after all his peccadillos, you'll make it. When you come to Jesus and you say amen. 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 Okay. Got to hurry along. You're just talking too much here, people. Verse 6, we read a great description of our Lord Jesus. Here he stands in front of God's throne. The Lamb who has been slain, Jesus, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist, introduced Jesus to society. Behold the Lamb, capital L, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on that historic Passover in April, 2,000 years ago, God's lamb, Jesus, was sacrificed. The whole book of Hebrews tells us that no longer is any more sacrifice necessary. He is our sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. So here stands Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, before the throne as a lamb who had been slain, which he was having seven horns and seven eyes. The seven horns indicate power. Later on, perhaps in our prophecy study, we'll get into that more when we relate to Daniel, but the horn always refers to kingdom power, 
He has power. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Page 5, the seven eyes symbolize once again the omniscience of God, seeing all that goes on in the world all the time. Darlene, my precious wife, says, I have a, a seven-second max attention span. Why would she say that? And it just looped. Because Jesus seeing all things reminds me of another absolutely wonderful story. About a guy who was robbing a house one night. It was pitch black in this house. He knew nobody was home because he had scoped it out. And he's got his bag in there and he's filling it full of silverware and jewels and what money he can find. But there's a parrot in this dark room. And the parrot says, ah, Jesus is watching you. You know, give me this Jesus stuff, you silly parrot, I'll wring your neck. And he's filling up the bag. Ah, Jesus is watching you. He said, about one more time, parrot, I'll just break your neck. About that time he hears, and he shines his flashlight right into the muzzle of a pit bull. And the parrot says, get him, Jesus. Sorry, Lord. That's just, that's just funny to me. Now, Jesus takes the scroll out of God's hand. Remember, it's sealed with seven seals. In God's coming judgment on this earth during the tribulation, in which, as a child of God, you are not here. The judgments basically are broken down into three categories. I don't think this is in your notes. You might want to write this down. The first category of judgments, the first ones to come, are the seal judgments. Every time Jesus breaks a seal off this book, there will be a divine judgment. Then come the vile judgments, like little test tubes, V-I-A-L, little beakers in a laboratory. And every time one of those vials is broken, those beakers is broken, it's another judgment. And then the trumpet judgments. Every time an angel blows a trumpet, the final three judgments sound. But now we're talking about the seal judgments. And tonight I'm only going to talk to you about the first four. So in the middle of page five, you will see the King James Version of the text. You can follow along in whatever Bible you want, or you can watch the screen. Here we go. At the same time that I saw the Lamb open the first of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures shout with a voice like thunder. It said, come out. Then I saw a white horse. Its rider carried a bow and was given a crown. He had already won some victories and he went out to win more. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come out. Then another horse came out. It was fiery red. And its rider was given the power to take away all peace from the earth, so that people would slaughter one another. He was also given a big sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come out. Then I saw a black horse, and its rider had a balance scale in one hand. I heard what sounded like a voice from somewhere among the four living creatures. It said, 
a quart of wheat will cost you a whole day's wages. Three quarts of barley will cost you a day's wages too. But don't ruin the olive oil or the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come out. Then I saw a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death, and Death's kingdom followed behind. They were given power over one-fourth of the earth. And they could kill its people with swords, famines, diseases, and wild animals. When the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of everyone who had been killed for speaking God's message and telling about their faith. They shouted, Master, you are holy and faithful. How long will it be before you judge and punish the people of this earth who killed us? Then each of those who had been killed was given a white robe and told to rest for a little while. They had to wait until the complete number of the Lord's other servants and followers would be killed. When I saw the Lamb open the sixth seal, I looked and saw a great earthquake. The sun turned as dark as sackcloth, and the moon became as red as blood. The stars in the sky fell to earth, just like figs shaken loose by a windstorm. Then the sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all mountains and islands were moved from their places. The kings of the earth, its famous people, and its military leaders hid in caves or behind rocks on the mountains. They hid there together with the rich and the powerful and with all the slaves and free people. Then they shouted to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. That terrible day has come. God and the Lamb will show their anger. And who can face it? are the first six of the seven seals, and we're going to talk about the first four. You have to understand that this is the opening salvo of the tribulation on this earth. Children of God will not be here. We'll be around the presence of the Lord on the throne. <clears throat> Many of my friends, wonderful Christian friends, are absolutely convinced that we're going to be here for at least half of the tribulation, if indeed not all of it. Some years ago, I was uh, up at uh, the 700 Club with uh, Pat Robertson. If you've not been there, it's one of the most incredibly well-equipped television studios in the world. Um, I've been out to watch Bob Barker on the uh, on uh, Price is Right some years before that. He was a friend of my mother, and uh, CBS had nice stuff that can't compare with what Pat had. And Pat's just got the ultimate. <clears throat> Pat's going to stick around for the first three and a half years of the <laughs> tribulation. So I said to him, uh, I'm really grateful that you have all of this incredible equipment so that those first three and a half years you can videotape all this stuff that's happening. And then when you catch up to us, bring the video with you, because <laughs> I'd like to see what I missed. I've never been back to... Uh... <laughs> it's kind of an interesting sociological uh, thing that and it's really kind of true, I believe, that mid-tribbers and post-tribbers do not have a sparkling sense of humor. 
they see everything in its worst possible spell. But we're going to be around the throne. So some of my friends who are going to stick around for this say, in this world you have tribulation. It's true. Jesus said that. I believe that. But the tribulation, talk about the tribulation some of the saints are going through today in some of the countries in Africa where they're being slaughtered for their faith. We are told there have been more martyrs for Christ in the past 15, 20 years than any other similar period of time in history. And I believe that's true. There have been slaughterhouses of Christians in Islamic countries. Terrible things that have happened. So my friends say, see, that's the tribulation. Yes, but what they don't differentiate is this is man's inhumanity to man. This is man's wrath against other people. There's an enormous difference between human wrath and God's wrath. The tribulation is a time of God's anger against this earth. The curse is going to be fulfilled. There was a curse put on the earth in the Garden of Eden. There was a curse put on Satan. That has yet to be totally fulfilled. There was a curse on you and me as human beings. But Jesus became the curse for us on the cross. So when we come to Christ, that curse is lifted. But the curse on the earth is still in effect, and certainly the curse on Satan is in effect. And both will be fulfilled. But the child of God is not under the curse. The tribulation time is going to be an awful, awful time of God's anger, not man's anger. The first seal judgment. First four seals of the scroll of judgment are often referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Apocalypse means revelations of God's final dealing with mankind on earth. And those four that we're going to talk about are Antichrist, war, famine, and death. As Jesus removes the first seal from the scroll, see him do it, takes that first seal off, it unleashes Antichrist on the earth. Just as there is a holy trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is an unholy trinity, Satan the Father, Antichrist, his protege, his counterfeit masterpiece is the Son, and the false prophet with whom we'll deal a great deal in a few weeks is the unholy spirit. Now when Jesus takes the seal off the book of judgment, then Antichrist can be revealed. Stop looking for him now. You're not going to find him. He can't come to this earth in his power until Jesus pulls the seal off the scroll, at which time we're already with the Lord. Antichrist comes riding on a white horse. Satan, powerful though he may be, is not an original. He's never had an original thought in his miserable brain, in his whole miserable life. He is a counterfeit artist. He knows that when we get sometime to the 19th chapter of Revelation, Jesus, the Son of God, comes back to this earth. Not the rapture. This is the second coming when he actually comes to this earth. Zechariah talks about this. When he comes, Mount, the Mount of Olives will split in half, north to south. You can read about it in Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, he that sat on. This is Jesus coming, Jesus coming. So Satan knows the Bible. He knows it better than you and I do. He knows that when Messiah comes, he comes astride the white horse, the sign of royalty, the prince of glory. So he has his counterfeit Christ come on a white horse. Notice on line 24, Antichrist shows up with a bow, but no arrows. Many scholars believe that Antichrist will make his move on the world by a peace platform. And on that platform, he goes out forth to conquer the world. God knows everybody wants peace. People are so weary of war, they can hardly stand it. I'm 71 years old. There has not been one day in my whole life, not one day in my whole life, there has not been a war somewhere. 
Think about that. Jesus said in the last days there will be wars, rumors of wars, and the world is so weary. Send us somebody who can bring peace. So here comes Antichrist to offer a covenant of peace. Israel will buy into it lock, stock, and barrel. The West will buy into it lock, stock, and barrel. The Far East will not, as we're going to see, but Europe will certainly, the Western world will certainly. He goes forth to conquer. But there'll be two major obstacles in his pathway. Look at the box at the bottom of page seven. The Russian coalition and the realm of Islam. And as we're going to see in the next sealed judgment, both of these obstacles will be eliminated. Now, if you'll stick with me for it, can you give me 15 minutes more? If you gotta go, just get up and leave. I will call out your name, but I mean, go ahead. <laughs> One of my favorite books in the Old Testament is the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a kid, 17 or 18 years old, the second time Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians invaded Israel, about 600 BC. The first time they came down, they took away most of the loot from Solomon's temple and uh, a wave of prisoners who included Daniel. The second time they came through, they looted some more and they took away the, some more captives, among whom was Ezekiel. They're carried away over to Iraq. See, nothing much changes in Iraq. And the people of Israel, the Jews, are there in captivity for 70 years. During this time, if, when you get to the 37th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, he's in Babylon, five, 600 miles to the east of Jerusalem. But he writes, the Holy Spirit picked me up and took me in the Spirit to this great precipice, this ravine. Now, you've got to use your imagination here. I want you to see this. Here's Ezekiel. Ezekiel's kind of an old country boy. He's not sophisticated like Daniel anyway. So he's on this ravine and down below, and if you've ever been to, uh, to southern Israel, you know how rugged it is. Here's this canyon down there. And the Holy Spirit says, Ezekiel, what do you see down there? He says, well, it's full of bones. Dear God, they're human bones. They're bleached out, dry, disjointed, Human bones. 37th chapter of Ezekiel, read it. it. Makes me laugh. You say, well, you got a weird sense of humor. I know, I know. So here's all these bones. And God says to him, Ezekiel, prophesy. Can those bones live again? It's a loaded question that does not have a right answer. No matter what answer you give, it's stupid and it's wrong. Because if Ezekiel says, why, of course, Lord, those bones can live again. God says, well, you idiot, look at them. They're dead. The bones aren't even connected. There's no flesh on them, nothing. They're dead, Ezekiel. What kind of an answer is that? So he can't say that. So if Ezekiel says, well, no, Lord, those bones can't ever live again. I mean, look at them. And then God would say, don't you know I'm the God of all life? I can do anything. What's the matter with you, Ezekiel? Don't you have any faith? It's a matter of what Ezekiel says, he's wrong. So he hears God say, Ezekiel prophesy, can those bones live? And Ezekiel, whose mama did not raise a moron, said, oh God, you know. <laughs> Great answer. Now as he's looking, suddenly here comes a wind. And looking down from this precipice, he sees this he hears the wind blowing through the canyon, but he sees the bones starting to come together. <laughs> Toe bone connected to the foot bone, foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the leg bone, leg bone connected to the thigh bone, thigh bone connected to the hip bone. You heard that old song? It goes clear up to the skull. It takes forever to sing the song. Now, this canyon is full of skeletons just standing there in the wind. And Ezekiel listens very carefully, and he can hear playing in the background. He 
sees a guy with a cigarette saying, you're standing in the twilight zone. <laughs> These skeletons are down here. And then the wind gets louder <laughs> through the canyon. And now Ezekiel's eyes must have looked like soccer balls. He looks down and flesh is starting to come on those bones. <laughs> Now facial features and hair. And now the canyon is full of millions of zombies <laughs> just standing there swaying in the wind. <laughs> and Ezekiel says, who, who are they? God says they are the whole household of Israel. I'm going to bring them back together. They were scattered all over the world. Study the history of Israel. It's the study of dispersion. In Tel Aviv is an incredible state-of-the-art museum called the Museum of the Dispersion. And you go in there and you study all the times the Jews have been scattered all over the world. Why, Pastor Betcher, when we get to the 12th chapter of Revelation, we'll find out why that is. God says they're going to come back together. But as he looked, they were just standing there. There was no life in them. And now God says, watch this, Ezekiel. And he breathes once again into them the breath of life. And they come alive. You say, well, what does that have to do with any of this? In 1948, in my lifetime, the bones came together. And Israel was born. And the spiritual life that is going to come into them is going to come as a result of this second seal judgment, which is war. When Israel sees God deliver it supernaturally from the invading forces, who are identified for us here in the second seal judgment, there was not another horse that was red. Powers given to them, they should take peace from the earth and they should kill one another. Now look at line 22 on page 8, and I go back to Ezekiel 38, and here are the invading armies identified, and their target is Israel. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him. Thus saith the Lord God, I'm against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back. I'll put hooks into thy jaws. I'll bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. So here comes the attack. Go to page 9. You can read the scripture. It's there for you. Bottom of page 9, line 35. Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal historically are Russia. This is not something some evangelical scholar just made up. Historically, Meshach is Moscow. So we're identifying here that land formerly known as the USSR, Russia. I wrote for you, when U.S. President Reagan and Russian President Gorbachev formed detente or peace between our nations and the Berlin Wall was torn down, we saw an open door in the former Soviet Union for dialogue and understanding. Darlene and I joined uh, Charles and Lil McKinney a couple of years ago out at Gulf Coast University to attend a lecture by Mikhail Gorbachev, set 50 feet from the man. He and Reagan changed the world. And it looked as if all of the fears, 
All of the tensions were eliminated. The Berlin Wall came down. We had an open door into Russia. We have sent untold millions of dollars in there, hundreds of millions of dollars for evangelization, building churches. Thousands of churches have now been opened in Russia. It's incredible. Good dialogue between the two nations. Now along comes President Vladimir Putin. And it's different. It's getting tight once again. And Putin has never made any effort to hide his antagonism toward Israel. Why that antipathy toward Israel? Look at the box on page 10. We'll find the root cause is clearly laid out for us when we get to Revelation 12. Here are the other armies. Persia, that's Iran. Who's playing footsie with each other today? Russia and Iran. Ethiopia, we see the Muslim nations of North Africa coming into view. Libya. Gomer, that's great parts of Europe, Germanic nations. Now, even as we sit here, growing increasingly hostile to Jewish people, to Garma, Turkey, Armenia, the bulk of Asia Minor. Well, Israel can take care of itself, Pastor, she always has. Yeah, but she forgot she makes a covenant with the Antichrist for seven years of peace and disarms. So when this huge coalition comes down from the north, Israel sits there like a sitting duck. Oh, pastor, that's like Star Wars. Yeah. I sat in the office of the Sec Under Secretary of Defense for Israel in the Israeli Knesset not too long ago. And we were talking about things of Israel's defense. This is not a Christian man. This is a Jewish man. He's a Sabra. He's a general. He's an executive in the Knesset. I said to him, if you were the president of Israel, what would you do? He said, I'd take Lebanon, I'd take Syria, I would take great parts of Iraq, clear to the Euphrates, I would take all of Jordan, and I would take the Sinai Peninsula back. And I said, well, that's not politically correct. He said, no, but that's what I'd do. Remember, this is the Under Secretary of Defense. I said, why? He said, two reasons. First of all, then we'd have the land God promised Abraham. And secondly, we would have a buffer for defense when Russia and her forces attack us. Not if, when. So you may think this old pastor is just kind of out in space here tonight. The Israeli Defense Forces don't think so. The Knesset doesn't think so. It's the Church of Jesus Christ that's sound asleep and doesn't see what's happening all around them. Well, what's going to happen to Israel? America will come to her defense, not according to Ezekiel 38, and I don't have time to even get into that. But we're going to learn that God swoops down against Russia. Um, the third seal is famine, which comes as a result of these wars. Now go to the last page of your notes, page 11. The fourth seal judgment, death, up to one-fourth of the world's remaining population following the rapture is going to die in this opening salvo. There are currently over six billion people on earth. Suppose that two billion were taken in the rapture, leaving four billion behind. I have no reason for those figures. It just makes the math easier. The first four seal judgments, the four horsemen of the apocalypse will take out over one billion human beings. You compare that to the ravages of World War II through which most of us lived that killed 60 million, 7 percent. From 19, September, September 1st, 1939 to August of 1945, the years of the war, 60 million people died. They died in the war, they died in pogroms, they died in concentration camps, they died of different diseases that came in. One million in Stalingrad alone, 60 million people died, and we read about it, and we see the pictures, and it is horrifying. That's 
of the people who lose their lives in the opening salvo of the tribulation. And you want to hang around here for that? Ezekiel tells us it will take the Israeli people seven years just to burn the weapons of war from the invaders because God comes down and as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah absolutely rains down fire and brimstone on the invaders. It will take the Israelis seven months just to bury the weapons, seven years to bury the weapons of war. It will take them seven months just to bury the dead. And the tribulation has only just begun. Next Wednesday night, the remaining sealed judgment, the revival in Israel, Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 9, through chapter 7, clear up to chapter 8, verse 1. So you might begin studying on those when you get home. Let's stand. Thank you for giving me a few extra minutes here tonight.